I'm glad to see you all still here. I hope everyone's managing to get some manufacture of fresh air by sending it out and then receiving it again. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for sticking it out, and I hope that the earlier ending will, will be helpful for everyone. And thank you for those of you who put questions in the bowl, which I just had opportunity to read through quickly. And I think my approach right now will be to, I saw some uh, underlying themes across the questions, so, and then I had some thoughts through the day of what I wanted to address this afternoon. So I'll try to do that in a more or less um, overview way now, then we'll meditate, and then I do want to be sure I've uh, uh, opened to questions uh, that people want to ask live, and then I'll go back and read. And whatever we haven't covered this evening, of course, I will let Lama Allen know some of the questions that were directed to him. And so if you don't hear your question answered this afternoon, have faith. It'll come tomorrow or the next day. And, and some of these questions are so sophisticated. They're beautiful, perfect questions. But I know that in the course of the retreat, Lama Allen will be covering that material as well. So that's why we are continuing to coordinate. But I feel like the, the theme of my talk now is, is really our worldview check-in. How it's, it's amazing to learn the, te the details of a practice like this. And we've already talked so much about motivation and, and what are we seeking, what is the kind of happiness, deep well-being we're seeking. But again, I know you're all coming from very different backgrounds, and so these are questions I can't answer for you. Alan can't answer for you. Each of us has to continue to ask, what is the worldview I'm living in? We can live in worlds and we can live in worldviews, and our worldviews shape the world that we see. And just as our state of mind so deeply affects whether something will be pleasurable or not pleasurable to us, so all the more so, our worldview completely completely affects the kind of experience we'll have day to day and even the way that our actions will be able to affect our world depending on how we see the world. So it comes down to this classic trio of view, meditation, and conduct, uh, which is very specifically used within the great perfection uh, tradition. You always hear about view, meditation, and conduct, but I've heard Lama Allen uh, broaden that in many different contexts, actually. Um, how is it that our picture of reality affects our values, what it is that we will cultivate our meditation, as in bhavana, cultivate day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, and then that directly affects our conduct. So meditation, as you know, is not just on the cushion. It's what we're cultivating. And then our conduct becomes the expression of that. Uh, and so if in this particular retreat, shamatha is the focus of our meditation, uh, we can't skip continuing to ask the question of what is our view? And then how will that affect our conduct? Uh, not only coming out of this retreat, but day after day, year after year after that. And so I saw a theme in some of these questions about um, discernment, really. And you may not have phrased it that way, but it was a question of discernment. How do I know h how I can make my most life most meaningful? And that's not just my um, hours on the meditation cushion. That is the choices we're making, because we do have choices all the time. Uh, and as you may have intuited from, from Lama Allen's um, brief overview of my story yesterday, I've had to make some pretty big discernment decisions in the course of my life. Uh, and I didn't know what was next. I didn't know what it was going to lead to. Uh, so I guess I can say I've, I've had some very deep and beautiful teachings on discernment from both Buddhist and Christian traditions. Um, but I'll say it's also something I have given a great deal of effort to in the sense of the time, the prayer. And this is where just plain prayer becomes so powerful because sometimes it's hearing our own heart pray 
hearing our own heart's expression of what it is that we need, that, as I was saying yesterday, for many of us, we may be able to believe that there is an omnipresent, omniscient compassion that hears us. But if, and I've struggled with this, if that awareness leads us to maybe think, well, why do I need to pray? Because mm, that mind already knows my mind. That would be a wrong view because the prayer is what we need to hear ourselves say. Does that make sense? And it's not just in terms of discernment. It's our prayer for, o for others' health. It's our prayer for world situations that catalyzes an energy within us, which of course we know that collectively when many people are praying together, that's power. And one almost doesn't need to have a particular worldview to recognize there's an energy here. Uh, but as for the details of how prayer works, it's very hard to speak of outside of a particular worldview. Uh, so our meditation today, actually, I, I think we've, mm, we've had several good sessions of shamatha today. We'll have far more tomorrow. Because it's so hot, I think it's good now to use a conceptual state of mind for our meditation. So it'll be much more in the mode of prayer, discernment, looking inside at what's driving us, what, what our unanswered questions are. So th that's a little preview for the meditation. But there's another theme I want to address first, which is closely related. And that is in sh the practice of shamatha itself. Alan spoke a great deal today about relaxation and how essential it is. Uh, to be able to get our, <laughs> take the first step right. Because as he intimated, he and so many probably of us here, uh, and certainly I think very well-trained um, monks and nuns through the history of, of Buddhism have made significant efforts at shamatha practice. But without the relaxation, even among the most well-trained geshe, uh, that can lead straight to what's known as a lung condition, which is like hyper, well, hypertension of the whole psychophysical system. Um, not necessarily high blood pressure, but it's a, uh, there are many grades of, of lung, and the word may be overused among Westerners who hear about it, and then as soon as they feel a little bit off balance in a retreat, oh, I have lung. No, not necessarily. Uh, actual lung is a very serious heart condition um, from the point of view of the, the inner subtle winds. But hopefully, none of us will ever get close to that if we understand this key of relaxation. Uh, but it struck me that the even deeper question, and again, something I've faced a great deal in retreat, is what are the inner causes of our tension? Because if, if someone just says relax, uh, it may feel nice the first time, like, oh, just fresh air how things go. But as I ind indicated yesterday, once you're in a, some kind of sustained practice environment, especially a retreat environment, and all you have left to do is relax, it's actually not so easy. I, I, I sense from your response you know what I mean. Because we immediately have to face, not just physically, but at the depths of our being, what is it that is afraid to relax? And so tension, as we know, is so intimately related with fear. And you'll sometimes hear Lam Allen say, release your breath fearlessly. And again, it, it there's, can be this blessing of hearing that for the first time. Uh, wow, could there be a place where I could release my breath fearlessly as if it was my last and not go into terror that I'm going to die. Um, well, what about being able to sustain that state of fearlessness when we are also dredging the depths of our psyche and all of our worst fears are arising? Uh, so I've only asked questions so far, but I feel they're meaningful questions for us. And sometimes just asking the right question is is enough to open our inner resources of knowledge.
But in very classical Buddhist context, the question of fear is an essential question to lead to refuge. And as Lama Ella mentioned this morning, there are very specific definitions of what Buddhist refuge entails. Uh, and the object, and as again, I had to use that word yesterday, object in Tibetan doesn't mean a physical thing. It means that which is the object of our awareness, that, that which is the other pole of a knowing state of mind. Yu uh, Ruchen, a field. Uh, it's literally the, the word in Sanskrit and Tibetan means a field. So that which is the field and that which is aware of the field. So the field of refuge, the realities that are at the other end of the pole of our yearning for shelter, for protection, for ultimate protection that will never fail us, are known as the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Uh, but it's all too easy to think of those just in a classical Buddhist iconograph iconographical context. But a beautiful image like this represents a life story, rep represents an enlightenment, represents an omniscient knowledge of all past and future lives. The truth, the, the reality of cessation realized by the Buddha, the cessation of suffering, the cessation of the causes of suffering, and the knowledge of the path there. So we know very well, I think, and I hope, but I can't take too much emphasis that iconography will always in some sense be culturally embedded. Uh, it can speak to us across cultures, that's often what's attracted <coughs> those of us who did not grow up in a Buddhist society to seek out Buddhist meaning because something attracted us. Um, But once we understand the meaning of the symbols, we can transform the symbols t and, and discover them in what means the most to us. And so the real Buddha is the Dharmakaya, is the limitless, boundless, timeless state of omniscient awareness, primordial consciousness. The word is Yeshi, Yeshi, uh, yeshi Bichupu in Tibetan. Uh, The Dharmakaya that knows all knowable things, past, present, and future, in a single state of mind. Uh, and not only as they appear to the living beings whose karmic propensities interact with things, but as they are in their ultimate nature. So that these two kinds of seeing, the seeing the ultimate reality of things and the seeing things in their manifest appearances. could be a whole course and retreat just to speak about the meaning of the Dharmakaya, much less the other kayas or manifestations of, of a Buddha. Uh, but that may be the most important thing to say. A Buddha knows all. And that can't be depicted by a, any particular form of a meditating being, even under a bodhi tree. One has to try to comprehend the infinite mind of the Buddha which is neither singular nor plural, because as we know from the Mahayana, there are countless Buddhas, all with equal realization. But within the Dharmakaya, and this is stated explicitly over and over again, the essence of the mind of all Buddhas is one. And Tibetan Buddhism is very clear about that also. You can't, you can't hold mm, cut and dry distinctions between the mind streams of Buddhas as though uh, they're all separate. But then the qualities of the Dharmakaya are not only this knowledge, but it's love. Kensei Nyu, you've heard of, um, it's also Kensei Rinpoche, this name Kensei is very common. It means knowledge and love, Kensei. And so this love, Tsewa, Chamse, as you'll often hear the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama say, it's a tenderness. It's, it's the love of a mother for her child. It is, care, 
that looks upon every living being with the intimacy that will do whatever each one of us needs. And then nu is the third quality, so tian si nu. Nupa is simply capacity to do something, it's an ability. And the word is used across all kinds, it's as simple as the English word ability, it's everywhere. But in this case, the nuba of a, of a Buddha is the capacity to help us, and specifically the capacity to guide us along a path. Uh, because, as you may well know, that in, in Buddhism it's very clear, the Buddha, as it said, the Buddha can't wash away sins with water. The Buddha can't just, by taking your hand, take you out of samsara because samsara isn't a place, samsara is a state of mind. And because our state of mind is perpetuated by our state of mind, we have to change our state of mind in order to escape from samsara. <laughs> Does that make sense? Nobody else can change our mind if, if our mind has not changed from within. But we can have guides. And then there's, there's a fourth quality that Lama Tsongkhapa describes in, in his great book on the steps of the path which is not only does a Buddha have the knowledge, love you enough to want to care for you and have the capacity to do so, but they will do so, whether or not you make offerings, whether or not you, uh, and that's actually a comparison to a view in a non-Buddhist school where there's the assumption that, well, you kind of have to propitiate the gods so that they'll help you. Um, but the Buddha's love is given freely. So then again the question can come, well, but why do we need to pray? Because we need to see it. So the calling from our hearts has to be grounded in the faith that we are heard. And I hope you can see how utterly trans-traditional these words are. I I'm speaking straight from Tibetan Buddhist tradition as I say this right now, but Omniscience, That's a, we can't quite imagine it, but it's, it's a human conception of what unlimited knowledge would be. And that's not limited to any one tradition. Infinite love, that's not limited to any one tradition. The capacity to help and guide us, that's not limited to any tradition. But the key ingredient now is faith. And it's not belief as in a creed, the way Lama Allen said this morning. Buddhism doesn't say, will you sign on the dotted line, do you believe all these things? But it does require faith. And so the two ingredients for refuge, well, it's really three ingredients, but the, the refuge is there. The refuge is the Buddha, the Dharma, which is the truth, primarily the truth of the path that the Buddha taught and teaches, always in the present tense. And then the Sangha, the community of those who have followed the path to whatever extent and are able to be like nurses. The analogy of the, the Buddha as the doctor, the Dharma as the medicine, and the Sangha as the nurses who help us along. Uh, so that's the, the, the third ingredient that must be there for refuge. But the, first, the two ingredients that have to be there from our side are the fear and the faith. Which means to take refuge, we have to understand our fears. We have to have plumbed the depth of our fe fears. And that's why the path of refuge is really never ending until we reach at least mm, the state of an arhat whose mental afflictions are forever uh, eradicated. Because as long as we have the seeds of the mental afflictions, we will have the seed of fear. Mm. So we have to have fear in order to take refuge, but we also have to have faith. Uh, if we're walking in a rainstorm and we see an umbrella, we have the fa faith that that, that or I mean a, an awning in front of a, a shop window. We see that shape and because of memory of past experience, we know that if we stand under that, we'll be protected from the rain, more or less. So we can go there. There's the reason, the impetus to step over under the awning. Very simple analogy. But it is good to think of the word refuge in a Buddhist context as being shelter, like that. And uh, just saying the words may not be taking shelter. 
Katsuchi, Katsuchi. It's a Tibetan way of saying, I take, I take refuge, I take refuge. But if one, again, is not imbued with the truth of the Dharma, then one actually hasn't taken refuge. But what I want to emphasize now is this personal connection with the Buddha mind, the enlightened mind, in any one of its forms or all of its forms, which hinges on faith. And that faith, in the end, comes down to faith in the nature of reality and faith in our own ultimate potential. Because if we believe that reality is such that we could never become a Buddha, taking refuge in a Buddha as someone outside of ourselves won't necessarily help for very long. Uh, well, technically speaking, it could bring us to a pure land after death, uh, which is not bad. Um, but, but still, fundamentally, the pure land, such as Sukhavati, one is born there by power of the prayers, which are Mahayana prayers, which still are grounded in the belief that we one day could become Buddhas. Maybe we're not ready in this lifetime, uh, but we're making the prayers that in the very near future, may I have the perfect circumstances, the perfect body, the perfect teachings, the perfect teacher, in order to follow the path all the way to enlightenment. And so, to believe that there is such a path, to believe that there is such a possibility, that the Buddha outside of us and the Buddha within us ultimately will be joined, the Buddha within ourselves will be actualized so that it is non-dual from the Buddha without us, outside of us requires an insight into the emptiness of our own being. And emptiness not in, as in just absence or vacuity, but as in not being fixed as just the way we think we are now. And so it is like an infinite potential, an infinite possibility of what this stream, this series of mental events that we experience could become. Could this stream of mental events that we look at inside our meditation one day be so transformed that it is a knowing that has no limits, that covers all things? That the surge of caring that we feel within us now has reached its limitless expression as love for every living being, past, present, and future? That our capacities to do work, the energy that we feel within us, uh, could one day be so perfectly trained, so perfectly honed, so perfectly in tune with the very nature of reality that it could manifest as countless bodies and, and beings as teachers, as guides, as, as ben uh, manifestations able to help living beings. Uh, both, in a, both animate and inanimate. They say the Buddha can appear as a bridge, the Buddha can appear as a tree uh, when you need it. And so to look at our own emptiness is not looking at a vacuity, it's looking at a possibility. Uh, but as I started to intimate yesterday, one of the most difficult things I find in the path of shamatha is when one is making efforts to practice meditation full time over a sustained period, you realize that the intellectual or conceptual uh, understandings, however deep they may be, in particular of the middle way, of Madhyamaka, of one's own emptiness, um, don't really suffice anymore to counteract the emotional depth of the demons and the obstacles and the psychological issues that will come up in shamatha. So there are questions always about the balance of shamatha and vipassana, and I know that Alan will speak much more about that, so I don't want to mm, 
give too much of a preview, but what I'll say for now is when one is going single-pointedly to practice shamatha, which at some point if one really wants to achieve it, one has to go single-pointedly, as in cutting out almost all other practices. And there's a power to that because you're starting to stream in this stillness of awareness, and no matter how bad it gets, you don't want to stray from that stillness of awareness. You don't want to get caught up in yet another conceptual um, analytical meditation to cut through the demons because the purification that's happening is deeper than the conceptual understanding can reach. And I'm not in any way suggesting that Vipassana per se, Vipassana in itself, doesn't require analysis. It does. But as I understand it right now, there's a, there's a halfway point where you're not ready for the full depths of mature vipassana that will come once one's reached shamatha. But you've done quite a lot of the preliminary techniques of understanding emptiness at a conceptual level. And I don't know how many of you this may apply to, but I think there are enough of you who have some background in analytical meditation on emptiness, uh, or at least understanding why I'm not my parts, why I'm not something other than my parts. Who's that agent who's different from my body and mind? Is there one? One can do a lot of analytical meditation on that and not be very far along the path of shamatha at all. And it's valuable to have an understanding of why I'm not inherently who I think I am. But to discover who we really are is a very, very long process. And just hearing words like, oh, you have a Buddha potential, there's a, there's a Buddha nature within you, it's great at the beginning, but it doesn't actually transform us, doesn't really deeply help us until we have the courage to go into this process of stillness, which is like going into a, oh, I'll give a ship analogy. I think I've only been on a long ship journey once, but you get on that ship and you have to stay on that ship until you get to a destination or until it crashes. You know, or, or it hits an iceberg. Um, and sometimes in retreat, you feel like you've just, you're the Titanic and you're sinking. Um, but, but then, no humor implied, that's when you have to have your refuge. And your refuge has to be so ubiquitous that can it, it reach you at the depths of the sea and it can reach you at the, in the height of the sky and it can catch you as you're falling from a cliff. The refuge has to be so ubiquitous. Uh, and I'll just say, from a Buddhist perspective, it is. From a Christian perspective, it is. You don't have to worry. The refuge is ubiquitous. But is our ability to take refuge ubiquitous? Is our ability to take refuge so deeply honed that even in a a very imperfect state of meditation, one that you've been working a while, you've been working a while, you're getting deeper, but you don't have perfect clarity, you don't have perfect stability, and you feel like you're being battered. Can the refuge, the act of taking refuge, be so deep that even as the waves are crashing and the lightning is striking, you know that stillness, that infinite, absolute stillness of the Buddha mind, of pristine awareness within us and beyond us, has never moved. And so the refuge is not words. The refuge is not conceptual thought. The refuge is an experience. And of course, there's a two-way street here of how do you relax enough to progress in the practice enough so that you can start to taste that but once you taste that, then that in turn allows you to break through more and more layers of this existential tension that we hold as long as we've not been completely soaked in the experience of refuge. Is that making sense? I know I'm expressing a lot of analogies layered on each other. I think you taste it. So I think it's time to meditate. There's not much more to say on that. We just, this is, this is, no easy answer, this is a long journey, um, but let's meditate.
begin settling body, speech, and mind in their natural states, slowly, step by step. And I'll describe it today in terms of the four elements as the settling of the body to lead us, to guide us towards the breath, which in this case is the speech. So begin by feeling the earth element, letting it exercise its gravity. heavy day, so let that heaviness just be. Feeling the points of contact with your body as the floor, the cushion. shifting to the experience of liquidity, fluidity within our bodies. <coughs> Occasionally we can actually feel blood flow or the saliva in our mouths. But right now, let it be more the sense of what is fluid? What enables your body to move without falling apart? And then let that liquidity shape you into an even more balanced posture. soothing any places of explicit tension. And then just feel the heat in your body. And again, not necessarily just the fact of being hot, but at a deeper level, what is the upward moving fire those of us sitting upright that enables you to sit upright. Even if you're lying down, what is it that lets you know you're alive, lets you know you're awake? This is the energy we need to draw on for our vividness. lightness of air. Most explicitly, the experience of the breath, but more subtly, these movements of prana, perhaps tingling through the fingers, the toes, in which we've sensitized ourselves in the belly. But right now, still letting your awareness fill your whole body, scanning all the places where the breath is moving. And explicitly releasing the breath all the way. Not controlling it, just letting it be. Finding its natural rhythm.
the stillness of your awareness. Sometimes even if you won't spend a whole session with your eyes open, it's helpful to open your eyes just for a minute now to settle the mind in its natural state. Quiet, clear, aware. Simple. And then explicitly for this meditation, where we are seeking our true refuge, our true motivation, our true prayer for discernment, explicitly bring your awareness to the center of your heart. And by this I mean your energetic heart. For many people, right behind the sternum, the breastbone, just in front of the spine, place of spiritual power that probably all of you have felt at one moment or another. So just let your awareness settle there. Not visualizing anything, but just experiencing that sense of deep centeredness. And without hesitation, ask yourself, what's your greatest fear? A flood of answers might come. And try to let the more superficial ones drift off quickly because you know you could get through that you could get through that that's not so important and dig deeper to a fear that really grips you is it the fear of dying is it the fear of annihilation the fear of hurting someone you love, of making a mistake you can't fix. Of failing to live up to our potential in this life. Is it fear of what happens after death? It doesn't matter what comes to you, but it is very important to identify for ourselves what the deepest one is. And then ask why. Why is that so ca catastrophic? There may be very good answers. We're not trying to brush away fear, just to look at it. And in this very process, you may see
some of your own deepest aspirations as well. For our fears are often fears of what may cancel our aspirations, what may make our aspirations impossible. Then ask yourself, are these fears of things that will happen to you? Fears of things you will do, might do, have done? Or are they fears about the very nature of reality itself? Do you have faith in the nature of reality? Is there a glimmer or more than a glimmer of hope? In a pure ground? A level of reality at which all is good. Is there faith in a source of love that can't be stopped by any negative force? If there's a glimmer of any of these things, let your heart leap out, let your heart leap forward. Let your heart penetrate through to the depths of reality and call upon that love that knows you. To manifest in the form of a divine teacher. And that may take form easily for you based on iconography and figures you have seen, encountered, know about. Or it may be a barely seen form of light, too bright to look at, too bright to allow to take concrete form, but you know that light is there and could manifest as a person you could see. Let your heart pray to that presence that you may be protected. And it's, it's important actually not to pray that we be protected from the object of our worst fear, but that we be protected from thinking that would destroy us forever because nothing can destroy us forever. And so we are actually praying to be protected from fear itself, from a fear that grasps onto any scenario as being catastrophic, too much to handle 
utter destruction. We pray to this sublime divine presence, enlightened presence, to protect us from the ignorance that makes us grasp onto the objects of our fear as though they were more real than ultimate goodness. see a ray of light coming from the figure in front of you, whether that figure is clear or not. See a ray of light coming from that being's heart to your heart. Cleansing you of all that stands in your way. Melting your grasping, melting your barriers and boundaries, all that hardens you. Melting your sense of identity so completely that you could face not being you without fear and know that there is a level of existence at which you will never be destroyed. level of awareness that is your ultimate source of happiness. Everlasting happiness that can't come from anywhere else. And as that light melts your heart, let it explode again from your heart to reach everyone else. human beings, animal beings, spirit beings you can't even see. Let your heart be an explosion of love. The love that wants to protect everyone else as you are protected. Then let that form of light that we've called in front of you melt further into light and enter your own heart upon that stream, that ray of light. You see the presence of countless living beings withdraw into your own heart as though your heart could embrace <coughs> all sentient beings everywhere and feel them present in your heart, each individual dwelling with that infinite tiny space within you. simply rest in awareness for the last few minutes of our meditation. Releasing all concepts, all explicit aspirations, and just resting in the stillness. of the meaning of the meditation we just did. And 
dwelling at the center of centers. may still arise, sense or impressions will still, still arise. But allow your focus, your attention to rest at a center that's deeper than your own body, a center that's opened to you by the Buddha, by the source of your own refuge. in an awareness that cannot ever be destroyed. In a place where nothing can ever actually harm you because you're not grasping for any false layer of identity. As I said, now I'd love to open up to questions that people would like to ask uh, verbally. And if there aren't too many, then I'll go back to the, the papers. Um, do you have the microphone, Jennifer? Thank you. Somebody over here. Over here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the for the meditation and. Um, I um, have a question about, you were talking about the, mi the mind, mm -hmm. the mind um, being addicted to, th to thought yesterday, yesterday, but in the teachings it says that thoughts and feelings are, uh, they have no essence. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to that a bit more? I mean, I, I don't really uh, understand what, where the obstacle arises, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Understand? I didn't quite hear or understand your first uh, sentence about, um, um, was it the distinction between mind and awareness? The distinction between mind and awareness that you're asking, or? No, no, you, you mentioned um, that there was an obstacle of, um, 
being addicted to thinking. Mm -hmm. So um, thoughts and feelings are transparent, correct? Transient. Transient uh, and transparent. And transparent. Just, they're just thoughts and feelings. Yeah. try to be brief, but I think I need to just do a little overview of, of Buddhist psychology to answer your question, because it's so useful, so incredibly useful, the, the classical Buddhist presentation of what are known as the five aggregates, or the skandhas. Are you familiar with the term skanda? Um, yeah, it's the easiest way to approach your question. So the Buddha taught uh, these five collections of other things. That's why they're called heaps or aggregates. And each of them can be examined. They're right there in our experience. Uh, but if one examines them deeply, one sees that there's nothing permanent in any one of them. Uh, and there's nothing inherently existent in any one of them. So just to review briefly, there's form, as in the form of our body. Uh, there's feeling and recognition or discrimination. Uh, and those work in very close tandem because it's in the process of identifying or recognizing things as things that our feelings about them arise. If we didn't have, if we just had raw, non-conceptual awareness, um, we wouldn't identify things as the individual things we see them to be, and most of our feelings wouldn't, wouldn't arise on that basis. Um, but just to finish the list, so there's feelings, there's uh, this recognition or, or discerning intelligence. Um, discerning, now it's not quite intelligence, it's more raw than that, it's, it's just identification identification, this is this, this is that. Uh, and then there's this very um, full and diverse aggregate uh, known as compositional factors or the things that are put together uh, from other things and that includes m all the other mental functions. So the Buddha specifically said, okay, I set out feelings and recognition separately because they're the source of most of our problems. Um, but then there's this other very complex uh, aggregate of mental events. Ment uh, mental afflictions are there, virtues are there. Uh, and then there's raw awareness. There's the simple consciousness of all six types. Our seeing, our hearing, our smelling, tasting, touching. Um, and our mental consciousness, which is aware of our thoughts. It's important to know these presentations well if one go, wants to go deeply into the practice of shamatha because you'll start, they won't just be abstractions, you'll actually see how the various mental factors are arising moment to moment to moment within a state of mind that is attempting to rest in stillness. Uh, again, whether t following the sensations of breath at the nostrils doesn't mean that suddenly everything else cuts out, as you all know your mind will be extremely active for a very long time. And so to be able to identify all the different kinds of things that come up is essential to the practice of shamatha. And then when one's settling mind, the mind in its natural state, as we'll do more explicitly from probably Thursday onward, um, you're explicitly just watching every single mental factor, feeling, identification, all, those three in particular, you're just watching the stream of them. And so you get to know your mind very, very well. And some of these things are what bring deeper faith in the Buddha's teaching because you see, oh, this is a totally practical presentation of the mind. Uh, but what I'm saying here now in this specific context is The practice of shamatha can gradually lead us to realize we're not any one of those things. Um, Lama Allen has made this point in a, in a different Dzogchen presentation 
of Vipassana in the Radhavaja Essence and, and other parallel texts revealed by Dijun Lingba. When it comes to Vipassana, all the emphasis in the presentation is on the body, is on you're not your head, you're not your arms, you're not your spleen, you're not your liver, etc. And I recall Lama Alan putting the question, it's interesting that he doesn't then say, well, you're not all the parts of your mind either. But his interpretation, and I really take this uh, it's just intuitively so correct, his interpretation was, by that time, in the sequence of those teachings, if you've reached shamatha, or you've come very, very far along the path of shamatha, you already know you're not your mind. Because you've seen every single face of your mind come up and go away. And that's why the practice of being able to rest in stillness, even as all these things come up and release themselves, is so essential. Because if one didn't have that distance, you'd think you're your anger, you'd think you're your desire, you'd think you're fear, you're th because that's what we habitually do. We, we grab on to every single mental factor and emotion that arises. So this is a more s complex answer, but I'm trying to address what it, what I think was your question, and I know it was implicit in what I said. Once we've seen all these parts of our mind arise and release, and we've learned how not to identify with any one of them, the question arises, well, what's left? And one might say, oh, mental consciousness, because it seems like that's the thing that we've trained to remain still. But in actually achieving shamatha, the course mental consciousness dissolves. Well, Alan will describe this in detail in the coming days. The course mental consciousness dissolves into a deeper stem level of consciousness. And that's not even human. That's not male, female. It doesn't have the personal history that we think we have in this life. It has the seeds of personal history going back countless lifetimes. But it's the thing we think we're protecting when we fear for our lives, as to take a very obvious example that I think all of us should have, fear to, of being killed at any moment. The person we're protecting at that moment is unfindable. If we really look for who is the person I'm afraid I'm going to lose, this is one very valid way of doing emptiness meditation in Buddhism. Who's the person I think I'm going to lose? Because the great, great irony, according to Buddhist teaching, is the very self we're grasping onto when our life is threatened because we think we're going to lose it is a self that never existed at all. That's the profound irony of our fear. I'll say it again. The person we think we're going to lose by dying unless we're an Arya or an Arhat or a high Bodhisattva the person we think we're there, the way we're holding to that person it's a person that never existed at all but and this is the great but that doesn't mean we don't exist as Alan said earlier otherwise the person who's saying that isn't there and then nothing was said uh, but to gain this robust vision of a person, a mere name, a mere label of a person who's here with all these qualities, and one's observing these qualities constantly in the practice of shamatha, in the practice of being in retreat, it's not just sitting on the cushion. You're, you're, me, myself, and I, you don't have anybody else to engage with. That's part of the purpose of solitude as a practice to face oneself and let go of oneself, let go of all the attachments we think we have to who I think I am. And so as I say, what's left is not mental consciousness because we'll lose that, we'll, at the coarse level, we'll lose that too. But at the subtle level, and Lama Tsukapa calls the substrate consciousness or the, the um, stem consciousness, as Lama Ellen sometimes calls it, in, in a Gelug tradition, that's subtle mental consciousness. No problem, it's subtle mental consciousness. But until we've reached shamatha, we haven't directly experienced that consciousness anyway. So again, the person we think we are, we will lose 
or, or if it's held in a very self-existent way, we never had it all. So by dropping our anchor deeper and deeper, and as I say, this is a scary process because it means letting go of the person we think we are, but it doesn't mean ceasing to exist. It means gaining a deeper and deeper vision of the limitless consciousness, the limitless awareness that we are, and that's an awareness that has the capacity to love every being equally, that has the capacity to enact the, Buddha, the deeds of Buddhas. Um, but I think where a lot of misunderstanding comes in is as long as we're identifying with a coarse level of consciousness with our memories and, and our hair color, I mean, the consciousness that sees our hair color and sees our bodies and thinks, oh, I'm me, this me isn't going to become a Buddha. It's the dropping away of all our attachment, attachment in the afflictive sense. And when we are attached to ourselves, we can put extra good qualities on and we can put extra bad qualities on ourselves that aren't there either. Our, our self-attachment is even more complex than our attachment to others. Um, and quite pernicious sometimes, the way that we twist our self-image. But the practice of shamatha can just show us this. In a non-analytical form, you just see it. Uncomfortable as that can be, beautiful as that can be, it's not, it goes both ways. We discover parts of ourselves we didn't know were that beautiful. But then we have to let the identification go in order for a deeper, deeper, deeper identity to be revealed. And ultimately, there, according to the teachings of Dzogchen, the Great Perfection, that level of identity that will be revealed is already a Buddha. That doesn't have to become anything. But as long as we're identifying at any other layer higher than the depths of the ground, that's not a Buddha. And if we think it is, we'll be completely backwards. Does that help a little bit? So, wonderful question. Thank you. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask, can you elaborate on the concept of faith in Buddhism, in a Buddhist context? Is it faith in something outside yourself or faith in something within or is it something different again? Wonderful, thank you. Uh, there are many different kinds of faith, actually. Um, but it is identified as one of these basic mental functions that everybody has the capacity for, depa. Uh, I just want to think for a second to be sure I remember the three main ones. Um, I may want to look that up to be sure I've answered it completely for you, but there's a There's an admiration faith. That's really the, the first step, and that is definitely in someone else. Uh, so the first step of faith that most Tibetan lamas, Tibetan teachers would describe is you hear about the Buddha. You hear about the Buddha's deeds, his realizations, his teachings, and that sounds good. It's, it's a kind of an admiration. It's, a, it's, it's as simple as the child who, who sees a role model and says, I want to be like that. Uh, and that may not be the way that we use the word faith most often in English, but it, we see that it's still the right word. It's that kind of admiring faith. And then there's an aspirational faith by which we see the qualities we admire in someone else and start to say, I want to be like that. So it's both. Your question covered it already. Uh, it is then not necessarily it's a much later l step to really have faith in ourselves. But the aspirational faith is at least enough to believe that I could become that. It's almost what I said at the beginning about as long as we're holding to ourselves in a fixed way, we can't even believe we can become something va vastly different. So it's the admiration, the aspiration, and then Tangwe Depa is, is my favorite, I mean, I love the word so much because it, Tangwa, is um, 
is the clarity of totally clear water or of crystal. So it's correctly translated as clear faith. Um, but then this is where I feel a little uncertain. I would want to check the, the definition for you. Um, but it has to do with a kind of certainty that starts to come in when you put the teachings into practice. You've seen your own ability to, to enact those teachings. And it may, in English, not be what we'd call faith anymore as in just a belief. It's a confidence, which is rooted in the word faith, going with faith, confides. We have a kind of a confidence. This is something I can do. Um, so I'll check that for you. What is your name, just so I can? Catherine. Okay, thank you. I'll make a note of that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lobania. Um, I just want to, I heard you mention demons. I'm sorry? I heard you mention the word demons a few times. Are you talking about Maras? Yeah. As they arises during the meditations? Yeah. Right, okay. Um, the reason why I asked it, because I, a few times in meditation, sometimes things come up um, in shape of, you know, Maras. And is these the mind projecting it? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. When these things come up in your, as you're trying to focus on your breathing, mm -hmm. settle the mind and keep going. And as you go deeper and deeper, sometimes these images pop up. Right. Um, so yeah, I just wanna ask, cause I noticed you mentioned the word, I, I'm trying to understand like your thoughts behind that. Yeah, okay, lovely. Um, so, the word Mara is, is a very broad term for, for a dark, obstructive force. Mm. Uh, Mara is Sanskrit. There are many different words for demons in, in Tibetan, and some have a more concrete sense, as in spirits that are believed to, to live in, in trees or, or yeah. mountains and so on. Um, and some are, have a much more psychological connotation. But in this context, I'm definitely talking about the maras, and that's a word that everybody has probably heard at some point, the maras that come from within us. Um, and so primarily those are the mental afflictions themselves, mm -hmm. as in anger, jealousy, uh, and craving, etc. cetera. Uh, but it is not uncommon, in fact very common, as one is progressing in the, in the practice of shamatha, for these, these appearances to arise as dark forces. And there's a lot of that actually described in the, the revelations of Jujun Lingba, which Lama Allen has taught many times. Uh, and I know he will speak about this, this more in the next few days, but I'll try to uh, address your question for now. It will be different for everybody, what yeah. comes up, yeah. uh, especially depending on one's cultural um, inclinations and the things we believe are possible and the things we don't believe are possible. Uh, but the teaching is always the same, is continue the practice and don't, don't pay any attention to it. Uh, if, as someone from back there asked me about the, the um, dream images, like the hypnagogic images which are coming up, which aren't necessarily scary or, or, or negative, they're just random images, Sometimes just opening your eyes in a lit room can stop that from, from continuing. Uh, so one doesn't want to linger with any of them. And again, depending on your practice, if you're doing mindfulness of breathing, which I think you said is, is the practice that you've been doing, you said mindfulness of breathing? Y yes, I do my, yes, that's right, but also the Dharma practice as well. Ah, uh, even, even when reciting mantra or something like that? Especially or? when you do the generation stage, like when you're visualizing and then, yeah. Ah, uh, so other images coming than the ones you intend to visualize. Yeah, so as, as, you, as I'm visualizing and then I see these, these dark, actually I see these dark forces, yeah. Okay, so in basic instruction on visualization, uh, and I'm thinking of Lama Tsukapa at this point, 
He says, if anything other than what you intended to visualize comes up, just let it go. I mean, just pay no attention to it mm. and go back to the, the clarity that you're developing toward your yeah. object of visualization. But it is true, and as I indicated yesterday, the true stage of generation practices require an immense mental capacity mm. and stillness. And so what sometimes can happen when we're trying to do those practices before we are really fully matured in the path of shamatha, um, and that's no insult, it's just a matter of what one has spent time on, and I can speak very much from personal experience here, the struggle, because you're actually putting a lot of effort into trying to generate these images just from the space of your mind, mm. based on, I on depictions you may have seen, um, but still, when you're in your, in your meditation, you're trying to do it without looking at anything, right? So there's a kind of war that it sets up in our psyche because you're generating images and then other images want to jump in. And I think it is a time when relaxation is the key, the, the key instruction. Not to stop the practice if you've been given a practice and, and you feel that's, uh, well, certainly if you have a commitment, you will need to keep up the commitment. There are ways of reciting where maybe you're not putting as much emphasis on visualization. Mm -hmm. uh, that is one value sometimes to having a recitation of a sadhana if you're having intense problems with vi visualization, keep your commitment by reciting it. Back off. It's fine to back off. Um, but if it feels like it's something that you can just dispel by deepening your concentration in what you're already seeing, if, if the right images are arising, then just deepen your, your commitment to that. Um, of course, if you're actually reciting mantra, that's the best time because the mantra is your protection. Yes. That's the, what the word mantra means, is protecting the mind. Um, but if it's coming up while you are doing mindfulness of breathing, again, just... I haven't heard Lama Allen say it yet in this retreat, but relax, release, return. Relax your mind, relax your body. Don't tighten up. Don't try to push away because those images, we can personify them. They're not people, they're not sentient beings, but we can still personify them. It kind of, it helps lighten the mind. Because um, those dark forces tend to want, if I can personify, they want to bring us down, they want to make us uptight, they want to make us nervous. So the, the more humor you can use around Mara's, the better. Um, <laughs> and th uh, so relaxing already you're not being assaulted if you can relax. And then release, paying no attention to the image. Because the images by their nature are impermanent, if you don't continue to focus on them, they won't continue, mm. because it is in your mind. Uh, and then return to the breathing as, as your object. Um, I thought there was one more thing that was going to Yeah, remaining in the stillness of awareness is, is the most powerful antidote, and that applies to any meditation you're doing, because there always has to be the stillness of awareness, whether it's mindfulness of breathing or a Vajrayana generation stage practice. It's almost never taught, but one has to have the stillness of, of awareness in order to go through the, the stages of a sadhana without um, just creating too much energy in the mind. So with the mindfulness breathing, you constantly just focus, put your attention on the breath, right? The sensations associated with the breath. Yeah. That's a key word to remember. Um, because, as I said yesterday, you're not following the breath. Even when you're doing this, this Asanga's method of the, the mindfulness of breathing throughout the whole body, you're not following the passage of the breath. Oh. You're allowing your scope of attention to encompass the whole body. In Asangas, what Lama Allen refers to as a Sangha's method, and this he drew from the Shravaka Bhumi, he translated it some time ago. Um, that's the one we, we learned yesterday. So the awareness is covering the entire space of the body and then noting sensations as they arise in, in association with the fluctuations of the breath. Then what we'll do tomorrow is specifically the sensations of breathing at the nostrils, which sounds like what, what's familiar to you. Um, mm -hmm. But that's only one method, as, as we did today, the sensations at the, at the abdomen, it's a different practice from focusing on the sensations at the, at 
the nostrils. But it is important to say the sensations associated with the movements of the breath rather than meditating on the breath because then you'll start following the breath wherever it goes and then <laughs> literally as it departs your body, you'd feel like you're losing your meditation on breath. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Most importantly, the relaxation, ju just the releasing. And do f if you need to go, please feel free to go. I know that people need to um, get home, but I can take one more question. And then I'll, as I say, r review and think through the written ones and come back to you tomorrow. Um, hello again. Hi. Uh, often when people are seeking to develop a skill, um, they'll seek to, some people will apply a deliber deliberate practice method to that in order to make faster progress in developing that skill. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering uh, your view on the extent to which it's good to apply a deliberate practice method to developing shamatha, and if so, what that looks like. Mm. That looks like this whole retreat. <laughs> this whole retreat is a practice method for developing shamatha. And it's several of them, as you see. Um, I think it will be clear by the end of the retreat how the different methods that we're learning actually work together. Uh, because as Lama Allen has discovered, if one tries to just do any one of them, it may not be enough to integrate all the different layers of our being that we're working with and maturing. So the, the system of shamatha that he's teaching is an integration of, uh, as he says, gold standard methods that he has, has learned from completely authentic lineages, but he does integrate them in a way that I've not seen anywhere else, and he has tried and tested over many decades. Um, but it's still for each of us to apply to our own practice and see how is, how is that working for me. Uh, but these are definitely practice methods designed to develop a skill, and that's why it's okay. As profoundly spiritual as, as it is as a path, it's okay to say these are methods of shamatha, and we're developing the skill of attention. Uh, sustained attention imbued with relaxation, stability, and clarity. Thank you. Sure. I, think it's, I think that's enough for today. Um, s please be safe going home, and uh, carry with you that whatever prayer arose, every, as many people are here had as many meditations. Let your own, whatever glimmer of an insight, I'm sure it was just the beginning of something that came during our meditation, let that stay with you. And then hopefully you'll have a t time for at least one, maybe two more 24 minute sessions this evening um, to review the, the practice of the Burmese method that we did, the full body uh, awareness of, of the sensations of breath that we did. That's in code word known as the Asang Asangas method. Um, and then to revisit whatever insights you had into your fear, your faith, your, your refuge. And that manifests a bit differently for every single one of us. So thank you so much and uh, rest well. <laughs>